I love to walk these city neighborhoods and uh, I remember a couple of years ago I was walking down Cherokee Street. I was having kind of a rough day that day and uh, sometimes uh, when I'm under a lot of stress I smoke a cigarette. And I was walking down Cherokee Street smoking a cigarette and it was kind of a busy day, it was really noisy and this black kid about 15, 16 years old rode his bike, came up behind me and he turned around and he pointed at me and he said something and I don't, I couldn't understand what he said and, but I heard two words, I heard cut and kill and it really kind of freaked me out, I wasn't really sure what was going on and then when I walked a little bit and thought about it, I realized what he said. He said, you better cut it out, that's going to kill you. And he pointed to my cigarette. And at that moment, something kind of clicked. And I knew that in this city and in this world, we've got to do something different. And it took me a while to figure it out. But my passion for real estate and my passion for bringing people together transforming these neighborhoods and improving people's lives comes together in a way that's kind of unique. Um, I love these neighborhoods, I love these old buildings, I love the city, and that's why I fix houses. The city and these houses need love. They need a lot of love. And it's not just the houses that need love, it's the people. It's our kids, it's our communities, we need love. There's a lot of wonderful, wonderful things about St. Louis. We've got to expand on the great things. And it's not just the job of government or just the job of business or just the job of not-for-profits. It's all of our jobs. We, have to, we all have to come together to give this city the love that it needs. And the way that I do that is by fixing houses and bringing people together and transforming neighborhoods, transforming cities, and transforming lives. We're about to pull up at my latest project, which is at 2844 Michigan Avenue here in South St. Louis. And I'm really excited about getting started on this one. This is a house that, talk about needing some love, it's in really rough shape. It's really been neglected for a long time. The thing that's amazing about it is when it was built, they put a lot of love in it. There was a lot of love put into this house. It's not big, but there's a whole lot of really great features about it. And you can just tell that the people that built it loved it and were proud of what they were doing. And they created an amazing product. And now we're going to make that house amazing. We're going to make it modern so that it meets the needs of modern families. And we're going to make it beautiful again. We're going to give it the love that it deserves. Hi, I'm Jeff Steinman and we are here at an amazing rehab that we're working on at 2844 Michigan and I would love to show you around. We come up on the porch, we've done a little bit of work here, and but the really amazing part is when you get inside and see this spectacular space. What I love about this particular house is that, you know, it's not a big house, it's a 1200 square foot house, but the attention to detail and the love that was put into this house when it was built in 1908 is just amazing. Now certainly it's, there's been some neglect over the years and you see that we've done a lot. Uh, we've completely gutted it out and replaced all the drywall and all of the systems and everything inside. And we've also put in brand new historic replacement windows uh, throughout. We've got uh, all new windows, 12 new windows in this house, and uh, we're trying to maintain as much of the original character as we can while still modernizing it and updating it and giving it and making it something that a modern family would want to live in.
And this is the kitchen in this beautiful house. So you're gonna have, up front here you see a breakfast bar that's gonna have uh, the sink and the dishwasher and all that great stuff. And then along that back wall, you'll have the refrigerator, a nice range, and as many cabinets as we can possibly fit on that wall so there's lots of storage. That's one of the things about the old houses is they didn't come with built-in cabinets. So that's one of the things that we have to add when we update them. Brian, how's the scraping coming along? Oh, I think we got some goodness here. Yeah, you know, we decided to reuse all of the original, or as much as we could of the original millwork in this house, which is making it uh, look really cool, but it's also a lot of work. You know, Brian's been, he's got, uh, I think, what, five more doors to do after this one? Five more. And it's been, it's been a lot, it's been a lot of work, but how's it, how's it coming along? Well, it's beautiful seeing how the grain comes out. And yeah. There's imperfections in the wood, but that's what to be expected for having old doors. And just seeing the beauty come back is pretty magical. Yeah, and a hundred years of people opening and closing and probably even slamming several times these old doors and uh, we've managed to keep all that history. The amount of love that went into this house when it was originally built is just amazing. I love all of these original doors and we've done everything that we can to salvage as many as we could. But if you just look at all of the detail in these doors and how great they look, well, this one is up and installed and it's working, but it's not yet restored. When this is restored, it is gonna look like this, which is just amazing. This looks not completely, but it looks almost like the day that it was installed in 1908. I just love seeing these things come back together. It's so, it's so cool to, to think about the craftsmen who worked so hard on this and didn't have anywhere near the tools that we have today. And then we take our modern tools and our modern technology and we make it look beautiful again like this. It gives me a chill just to talk about it. And you know, this house is, is so interesting because it has all these funky angles, which has actually made the, the renovation of it really, really difficult. But the great thing is we now get to see what it looks like when we've got all this stuff back together and looking like it did when it was built. And again, we've got more of the new replacement windows up here. That's all the original trim that we've restored to make it look just like it did when it was installed. This house had original beautiful doors on it when we acquired it, and, but they weren't all usable. So what we have done is gone around to all the great salvage shops that we have in St. Louis because when they tear buildings down, the great thing is a lot of times folks go in and they actually grab those old doors and old millwork and fireplace mantles and then sell them to folks like us who want to put them back into a house. And uh, that's what we did with this half bath. Now this half bath is brand new. This wasn't originally in the house here on the first floor. Uh, so we didn't have a door for it. So we found this one at a salvage shop and we're just getting ready to put it up right now. So now we're getting ready to hang this door. Now we're at the point, we're at, sort of at the moment of truth. I spent quite a bit of time getting this door cut to fit the opening, get the op getting the opening prepared, getting the new hardware on. And now we are at the point where we are going to put it on to the door. So Daniel, if you could just hold it up a little bit so that the hinges line up. All right, now we're just getting it into position, and this is kind of tricky. You gotta have two people, and we don't wanna do anything that would uh, pinch the hinges or twist the door because that could cause, us, cause our wood to split out. Hanging doors is, I think, a lot of fun, but it also requires precision. So you gotta make sure that you get everything lined up just right so that when you're done the door actually closes properly so now for the moment of truth and 
there we are. Daniel, how's the painting coming along? Good, almost on time. Good, good. Uh, so Daniel's finishing up the painting on some of the exterior walls. What we did was, you know, the, the way these houses were originally constructed, the exterior walls just had plastered directly on the brick. And, uh, you know, we could have furred them out, and we did do that in some places, but uh, when you fur the walls out, then you create other issues. You lose square footage, as well as you mess up all of the trim around the windows. And we had a, a couple of windows on this back wall that were in really great shape, but uh, Daniel applied a new coat of plaster to them, and he's just now getting them finished up. How, was, uh, how did it go plastering the walls? Uh, it was a process. <laughs> uh, it was a lot of work, a lot of time-consuming work. You know, wanted it to look good, wanted it to match the consistency of the drywall, you know, the perfect smooth wall. It's hard to do with plaster. So, you know, you fur it out on the brick with plaster to get that R value, and then you skim it with some joint compound to keep the look consistent with the drywall. And now we're in the main bathroom on the second floor where Daniel is installing the tub surround tile. You know, I love this because we've used, we've used a subway tile, which is a very, similar pattern to what would have originally been used in a house like this, but it's a little bit smaller and I think it gives it an updated look while still staying uh, true to the integrity of the historic architecture of a house. You know, we had to get creative in this uh, situation because we got a window there right in the middle of the shower. And again, when this house was built in 1908, nobody took showers, they all took baths. So we've got to figure out how to get a shower into a bathroom that wasn't designed for one. So what we did was we brought the plumbing out here and then we've got the uh, shower coming out of the ceiling and we'll have a real nice curtain that goes around in a U shape around this uh, tub, which is the original tub with some beautiful Art Deco lines. We'll get that refinished and it'll look like it's brand new. I'm rehabbing this home to learn lifelong skills to help me earn money begin a career and someday own my own real estate business. I am rehabbing this house to earn scholarship funds for tuition and other educational expenses. I am rehabbing this house to make the community a happier, healthier, and safer place that the residents can be proud of. I am rehabbing this home so a low income family can own a house for a very first time. You've been watching these amazing transformations here on Transform STL, and that's a lot of fun. But it's also important to remember that when you've got a you've got your own house that's in good shape, you need to maintain it. And today we want to talk about one of the biggest and most expensive things at your house, and that is your heating and cooling system. And I've brought Dan Saliga of Saliga Heating and Cooling in to talk to us a little bit about what is it good to do in the springtime to maintain your uh, your heating heating and your air conditioning and make sure that you're keeping it in tip-top shape because we've got these St. Louis summers coming up and you right. don't want to be without air conditioning. Dan, what are some, uh, what are some things that, uh, that we should be thinking about in the spring? Well, Jeff, uh, you know, one of the biggest ways you can help your air conditioner run more efficiently uh, is to hose it out outside, uh, spray off all the uh, dirt and debris that accumulates on the outside. Of sure. It. It's going to help it not have to work as hard, be able to get rid of the heat from your house. Yeah, because some sometimes when you look at those condensers outside, you can actually see the dirt caked right. up on it. Yeah, if you see a blanket on your air conditioner, yeah. uh, it's time to take the hose out and just wash the coils off, uh, get that debris away from it from around the outside so it can breathe and, and transfer that heat better. Excellent. What about inside here? Uh, yeah, another thing you can do, uh, very important, is keep your air filter clean. Um, you know, we came over here and we checked this one, and if your filter looks like that... That is not clean. <laughs> that is not clean. Uh, you don't have to be an expert to no, know that. <laughs> you're going to have a lot of problems with your unit um, if you have dirty air filters. Why, so. why is it important to keep your air filter changed? Uh, it helps the airflow. Uh, you have a cooling coil in here and you need a certain amount of air going across it. 
in order for it to work correctly. So definitely on the filters, the cleaner the better. Probably want to be checking them at least once a month. Doesn't mean you need to change it once a month, but you do need to be checking them uh, and making sure they're clean. So that filter obviously needed to be changed. Right. What about, what, what's a guideline for someone, for one that's maybe not quite that bad? So, uh, you know, the, the filters, you don't want to get the cheapest filter you can get, but you also don't want to get the most expensive one. Yeah, because when you go to the when you go to the home improvement store, there is a whole aisle, and you could spend two dollars, or you could spend eighty bucks on a filter. Right. So, mm -hmm. if if you get the Super Allergen two thousand filters, you're going to be changing them every couple of days, once a week, because they're not letting any air by them to begin with, and then a little bit of dirt and and. You know, it's just like having a dirty filter in there. So probably 4 to $5 filter range is perfect. If you want to upgrade to something that's more efficient, um, you need to go switch out the cabinet uh, so that it accepts a like 4 or 5 inch filter that's going to have the surface area but not restrict airflow. Excellent. And do we just, we don't just put this in any old way, right? We have to well, look at the, these arrows. Well, the arrow usually uh, points towards the, fi the furnace. That's the direction of flow. And it's a good idea to always write the date on them so you know when the last time you stuck one in. Is. Great tip. And it's not complicated. You just slide it in, right? Nope. And the cleaner, the better. Excellent. Same with the air conditioner. Excellent. Well, and thanks so much for giving us this information because you got to maintain this stuff because it's an, your HVAC is important. It, there's, uh, it, it keeps you warm in the winter and it keeps you cool in the ferocious St. Louis summers. Um, and, and I think that uh, the important thing is, is to make sure that you take care of it because if you got to replace it, that's not a cheap thing. Um, so if somebody needs some help uh, with that, they'd like to have somebody come in and take a look. What are some of the things that you would recommend you have a professional? do on a regular basis so on professional preventive maintenance we'll come in we'll check the motor on the air conditioner uh, oil it if it needs be we'll check the electrical components capacitors contactors anything we can check uh, so that you don't break down when it's 100 degrees outside because your air conditioners don't break when it's nice out they break <laughs> when they're running 100% uh, in the middle of the summer. So if you have a little bit of preventive maintenance done, uh, it'll keep you from breaking down on Saturday night um, when it's 100 degrees. Sure, and those first hot days or the first cold days are when you get the most phone calls and you're backed up and as busy as, as you possibly ever, probably ever are. How long has Saliga Heating and Cooling been in business? Uh, my great grandpa started the business in 1927 and I'm fourth generation uh, family owner uh, right down on Gravoy in South St. Louis, and uh, we've been around a long time. Yeah. We treat the customers right. Excellent, excellent. So if somebody's interested in getting their furnace uh, or air conditioner serviced this spring, which is a great idea, uh, how do they get a hold of you? We're going to put the phone number on the screen. You have a website as well? Yeah. If they go on our website, SaligaHeatingCooling.com, you can find some coupons there, get a few dollars off on uh, having us come out and do that preventive maintenance. That's that Saliga, he, Saliga Heating and Cooling, S-E-L-I-G-A, heatingandcooling.com. Go to Dan's website. We'll also put the phone number on the screen here and get your HVAC checked out. Uh, Dan, thanks so much for coming thanks. on the show. Thanks I appreciate it, me. and uh, I wish you the best of luck. Okay, thank you. Well, Thomas, you've got prediabetes, but with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have prediabetes. Big time. Ah, oh, listen now. Can you hear the bluebird? up now can you feel the sun
This house has got spectacular brickwork. It, it always amazes me that a 1,200 square foot house has got such amazing detail, which you certainly don't see that anymore. But we wanted to be really respectful of it. We wanted to look. We wanted it to look as amazing as it did the day that it was built in 1908. So we had the entire front facade, as well as a considerable portion of the rest of the building, completely tuck pointed. And if you don't know what tuck pointing is, that's just basically a really tedious process by which you grind out the mortar in between each of the bricks and replace it with new. When we got the house, it had a really horrible red mortar in it uh, that was not historically appropriate, and it was also in really bad shape. So we completely tuck pointed the front of the house, and I think it looks pretty darn good. Look at this gorgeous staircase. Where else would you find a staircase this beautiful in about a 1,200 square foot house? At the turn of the century, they went to great lengths to put beautiful features like this in that you know you can only imagine how much time it would have taken a craftsman who didn't have any power tools at the turn of the century to create this beautiful feature. A lot of folks would have come in and torn this out or, uh, or, or something else like that, but we decided to keep it because it's just such a beautiful part of St. Louis history. It just needed a little bit of love. And you can see what happens before it had love. This is when it was, this is what it all looked like before when it was old and yellowed and hadn't been painted in many years and then when you see when we put a new coat of paint on it how beautiful it looks and this is a brand new deck that we put on the back the one that was here was in really rough shape and it wasn't quite as big so we've added this one that is going to give you plenty of room to add a put a barbecue grill and a couple of chairs in. Uh, there's nothing real fancy about the backyard of this house, but uh, you know, we did replace the sewer lateral, so it's kind of a mess right now. But we're going to put down grass seed and make this all look great. You know, when a house like this was built in 1908, nobody needed parking for two cars because most people didn't even have one car. This house did have a single one car garage that was in really, really bad shape and actually a storm uh, in, the, in the fall kind of helped us to bring it, helped us with the demolition. But we got rid of that and we added this great two car parking pad so that now a, a, someone who lives in this house now has a place to park two cars off the street. and we're down in the basement of the house. You know, there's a lot going on down here. This is kind of right now our temporary workshop. You know, we painted a lot of the trim down here and uh, we've also done a lot of work down here. You'll see uh, all the electrical and the plumbing that you see is all brand new. Uh, we've got a new furnace, a new hot water heater getting ready to go in and uh, we've got a new electrical service. We've done some work on the windows. We cleaned up these walls and painted them. You know, they had a, a million coats of paint and dry lock and whatnot on them, which we've cleaned off and uh, got them looking really good now. And we're in the process of getting all the underside of the beams painted so that it looks nice and clean. It won't be a finished basement, but it'll be a nice, clean basement that'll give you a great workshop or whatever you might need to do down here. So we're doing a pretty extensive repair on the cornice of this building. This is one of the beautiful features of these old buildings is these beautiful cornices. This one actually has the gutter integrated into it. It was in really bad shape. We've saved the wood that we could and then we've added some new wood where we can. Uh, this project isn't really that hard. The worst part of it is that it's, uh, oh Lord, like 12 feet off the ground. So uh, being up this high is not my favorite thing, but uh, you got to do what you got to do. So Brian and I are getting ready to put this uh, piece of crown in here that's going to support the gutter pan as well as uh, just make it look beautiful like it did the day that it was built. So we'll see how it goes. All right, so we'll have to slide. Yeah, we're going to be good there. Oh, that was my finger. Okay. So how does that? Yeah, uh, you're gonna want to go in a little bit more of an angle.
Well, we've got this substantially replaced. There's still some uh, touch up work to do. It still needs paint, but I am really happy with the way it looks now. It certainly hasn't been an easy project, but it's been quite a rewarding one. Uh, I just wonder when is the next time that somebody's gonna be up here working on this cornice. I hope it's another 100 years from now. We are rocking and rolling here at this project on Michigan. We're kind of at the final stages. We're at the stage that I like to call death by a million paper cuts because what happens is the place looks substantially finished because we've got paint on the walls, we've got light fixtures in, we got windows, the trim is all in and pretty much painted, but there's a million little details that we still have to wrap up and that is why we're working furiously to get this place finished and on the market in the next week or two. And uh, we've, uh, the second floor is, is pretty Pretty much done. We're just waiting for carpeting to go down here and just trying to get all those last little details buttoned up. You've been following us on this amazing rehab over on Michigan Avenue in South St. Louis and that project has been a blast but it's about more than just putting the love back into to one house. It's about putting the love back into our neighborhoods, our communities and most importantly our youth. And that's why I wanted to do something really special for the next project. And that's why I reached out to Green Builders for Equity, which is an amazing organization here in St. Louis. Neil, tell us a little bit about what Green Builders does. Yeah, Green Builders for Equity teaches you about financial literacy and empowerment under the construct of real estate development and investing in low-income communities. I'm currently co-founder, um, also with Mike Woods, and we have been working with Jermaine and Marvin on teaching them the skills necessary to earn money and build a career. So after they complete the rehab with Jeff, they will earn scholarship funds to help them pay for college tuition and other educational expenses to create a better future for their lives. I've met these guys, you guys are awesome. Can't wait to do more work with you. I can't wait to get started on this. This is an amazing thing. I can't wait, let's do it.